I think I'll make a start uh, just to get us underway, uh, but I'll do a bit of an intro to give people um, still a few minutes to join in. I'm Louise Stokes from Digital Leaders, uh, and it's my pleasure today to be uh, chairing this session and introducing our speaker today. So this is the session called the Introducing the Economics of AI, and we're joined by Sean McGurr today to take us through his presentation, but to also answer some of your questions. So do uh, send in questions as we go throughout the presentation, either by the chat or the Q&A, depending if you're joining in from the browser or, um, or the downloaded version. Uh, and also hello to those tuning in later on. Um, uh, it's great to see you here as well. We have got the comment section enabled down below. So do, um, uh, do utilize that if you're tuning into the recording later on. So to introduce our speaker today, uh, as mentioned, we're joined by Sean, uh, and he has over 15 years experience working with data as a practitioner across multiple industries, including uh, doctorate level training in applied statistics, consulting and automotive. In his role at, uh, as AI evangelist at Data, a data IQ, he uh, is focused on helping customers maximise value on their paths to um, enterprise AI while coaching and advising teams internally. Prior to joining the company, Mago uh, served as Head of Data Science and Business uh, Intelligence at Cox Automotive from 2016, uh, where he led team helping customers access, understand and engage with data to improve decision making. Prior to this, he was also uh, a data scientist at Optimal Business Intelligence, and he's also a co-host of the Half Stack Data Science Podcast and he lives in London. So welcome, Sean. It's great to have you with us today. Thank you, Louise. And a reminder to everyone else, uh, do send your questions through for Sean as we go. But yeah, over to you, Sean. Thanks for joining. Thanks very much, everyone. Um, there's going to be a, a short quiz in a moment via the chat functionality, but also do ask any questions as you have them along the Q&A. Um, thank you, Louise, for introducing me. I get to skip uh, doing that for myself. So it's great to be with everyone virtually. Thanks to Digital Leaders for the opportunity to speak with you. I'd love to hear your thoughts uh, and reactions to the presentation. So I will now share it. And my email address is there if you wanna get in touch with me later to discuss anything further. But yeah, I'm gonna talk for maybe 20-ish minutes. Um, love to answer questions along the way if they come up in, in the Q&A, Luis is gonna flag those up to me, uh, but there'll also be plenty of time at the end for additional um, Q and A. So as Louise said, I've been working with data for a long time and I actually started my own personal individual data journey in the public sector, uh, working for Statistics New Zealand on the, on the census. And so I've been interested in the role of data in government and in digital transformation of government for, for a really long time. And it's, uh, I'm working out of government now for a software vendor, but it's still a, a topic near and dear to my heart. So I'm really happy to be able to present our view on the economics of, of AI to you today. And what I'll be talking about is a problem that we see in the way that uh, business cases for AI initiatives are often built and some thoughts from us on how to correct those shortcomings. And you know we're offering these thoughts, this framework, because we see organizations do this often. It's an easy trap to fall into. And so you know we help our customers uh, out of this out of this trap um, and help them move beyond the, the kind of thinking that I'm going to critique here and offer some ways to, to move beyond. It's worth noting from the outset, there's nothing proprietary to data IQ. We're a um, data science machine learning platform. Um, that's the last thing I'll say about data IQ specifically. But um, if the ideas resonate and they're helpful to you, please use them or, and or reach out to me. I'd, I'd love to hear how they're useful or, or your reaction in any way. And it's also worth notice, noting that, you know, I've called it economics of AI, but these ideas are not just for commercial organizations, but apply equally to government public sector organizations as well. Okay, so to start with a little bit of motivation, why, why do we at DataRaiku talk about economics of AI? Uh, in the first place? Well, the first reason is that we, we like to do something beyond selling our, our software. Uh, we like to be more than just a software vendor and through our you know, 400 plus customers, we do see a lot of the challenges that are out there and we see the challenges that are being discussed um, at events like these and others. And so we try to find something useful that's um, in the middle uh, and gonna be valuable for people. And for me personally, you know, if anyone's at a conference 
and they can listen to practitioners or they can listen to former practitioners now working for software vendors. You know, we want to offer something that will actually hook people in and uh, try and add some, some value that you can use in your day-to-day -day work. The, the second reason there is um, getting started in AI is no longer as tough as it was. It's actually a lot easier to start playing around compared to how it was five or 10 years ago. You know, people can install uh, data science notebook software. They can, they can start doing proofs of concept. Um, but the difficulty is that uh, as easy as it is to get started, um, it's still very difficult to go on and take what you've been playing with and make it real and impactful. And it's quite a, a scary quote from this uh, Sloan Management Review article that points out a good rule of thumb is that for every dollar or pound you spend uh, developing an algorithm, you must spend a hundred to deploy and support it uh, over time, which is uh, really puts in perspective. You know, if that if that one one dollar has become really easy to spend, um, what I'm going to talk to you today is how people miss the business case for the other ninety nine or the other hundred that they're going to need to put that into production and, and make a real difference. And then the last reason, you know, the reason that we use the, the phrase economics of AI specifically is that we believe, and lots of other people believe, AI has tremendous potential that can only be unlocked when we articulate it, um, just like every other value that people are used to hearing about. And so, you know, what connects with your stakeholders is, is cost, it's risk, uh, it's benefits. We would say profit there if we were talking to a commercial organization. So the reason to talk about to use the title economics of AI is to both demystify what AI is and what it can be good for uh, and try and make it resonate with the people who whose buy-in you need to actually uh, make an initiative successful. So I mentioned the quiz. Very interested in, uh, in any answers. You can put them in the chat. Type an A if you think it's true that the UK is already using AI and digital government. Type a B if you think that's a false statement. Do we have anyone brave enough to vote in the chat? Yes, we have a difference of opinion because someone wrote B and other people have written A. So there's a few more votes for A than there is for B. And I'll be interested. The person who voted B so far, if you want to lob in a question and answer uh, to discuss that further, I'll leave you anonymous for now. Um, but if you want to discuss further, I'd, I'd love to. OK, so this is about the accessibility of AI. To improve a given process by using AI, you must be able to A, build robots, B, write code, C, sp fly spacecraft, D, none of the above are necessary. Anyone got an opinion on that one? Hopefully that's just a little bit fun to make a point that um, often when we see AI mentioned in the news, and particularly when we see it mentioned alongside the names of public sector agencies, there's often a narrative attached to it. You know, algorithms run amok or impenetrable black boxes or impossibly technical uh, people doing impossibly wonderful things. Actually, it works best when you know, we don't uh, put those stereotypes on it and when we lower that barrier to, to entry. Hopefully even more humorous for those a little bit more technical or familiar with some of the hype around data science. So is data science statistics on an Apple Mac is it 80% preparing data, 20% complaining about preparing data, or is it simply a set of techniques to scale data analysis into repeatable impact? So I don't know if some of you may have seen those first two definitions before floating around on, on Twitter and other, other media. Um, but to me at least, you don't have to be using an Apple Mac and it's, uh, you don't need to be complaining about, about data. It's just a set of techniques that allow you to, to do something. And that something is to take what we've traditionally done with data analysis, but turn it into something repeatable and, and, and impactful. And then what I'm really interested in um, for the rest of the talk and the context of the talk. So on your personal data journey, are you just getting started with something like spreadsheets? Are you dabbling in 
visualization with something like Tableau or Power BI? Are you pushing into self-service analytics, perhaps with our product or any other? Are you churning out code or none of the above? Have you not started your data journey at all? Or maybe you know, you've transcended D and you actually lead a team of data and digital people. So that'd be really useful for me just to understand if any of you are practitioners or data leaders, where you see yourselves on, on, your, on, your, on your own data journey. So I, I personally went through A, B, C, D, and F over a very long time. And actually now I don't know how I would answer because I'm the one asking the question. So, so we've got some, we've got a few E's. Welcome and thank you for showing up to this talk despite not having started. I, I appreciate that. And yeah, there's not gonna be any mathematics or really anything about data science. We've got one leader of a data digital team, welcome. And we've got the rest of the people who have started in, in some way. Great, thank you. Hopefully that was just a little bit of light entertainment to start off there. So a couple of um, examples. Uh, these aren't from the UK, but um, you know, just, just to prove that AI is helping public sectors uh, drive digital transformation. Some of these are data IQ customers, some of them are not. So in an unemployment agency um, in Europe, a team of five people built a tool that saves 500 FTE in document handling time. And that, what, you know, that, that sounds impressive, but the real benefit there was that it allowed those uh, individuals, the workers in the unemployment agency to actually spend their time advising people on how to get back into employment rather than uh, redirecting documents to different different places. And that's a nice example of analyzing incoming document text and using that to, to direct it to the right department. Some people's definition of government is uh, simply getting the trains running on time and uh, the national rail company in the Netherlands is at top three in the world. And what they did was use um, wheel sensor data to predict the maintenance needs of trains because if, if a train breaks down and needs service, it both uh, stops the trains behind it on the track and then it's often very costly to send it to the workshop at that point. But there are predictable patterns in the way the wheels wobble that can tell you that something is about to go wrong on the undercarriage of, of the train. Uh, and so that's something that, that they rolled out a few years ago to maintain that um, punctuality rating second only to Japan and Switzerland. And something else, uh, I'm familiar with the same use case from New Zealand. I worked with a team there that did the same thing. Um, one of our customers is using anonymized credit card spending data to understand where, where incoming tourists come from uh, and what they spend their money on while they're in, while they're in Dubai. So, you know, uh, there's plenty of this good work out there. And uh, at DataRaiku, you'll, we'll be, you you'll be hearing from us over this year, we're gonna try and find more of these success stories in the UK public sector in particular, and make sure they have, um, uh, the right level of, of publicity because we don't want it to just be uh, the failures and the scandals that get the news. Okay, so that's all a bit of motivation. So what, what do I mean? I've been hinting at this problem with business cases and the way that our initiatives are built. Um, and the problem is this, it can take an awful lot of convincing your stakeholders to actually invest in an AI initiative. And that can be tough enough in a large commercial organization, but there's lots of obvious reasons why it might be more difficult in the public sector. And if you think about all of the people and technology that you need to account for, pretty quickly, the costs of even getting started, um, you know, they pass a million pounds pretty quickly in annual expenditure if you're going from a, from a standing start. And because of those really high upfront costs, um, you have to sell some really high value use cases to the business to get there to get their backing. So maybe um, your agency uses AI to radically improve the personalization of the recommendations on your website. So it's easier for citizens to find relevant content. Or perhaps a smarter approach to fraud detection allows you to reduce losses. Maybe you're at the tax agency or maybe you're collecting payments and fraud is a problem. And so maybe that really impacts your bottom line. And it's obviously only natural when you get started to go after these high value high visibility, classic AI use cases to get that uh, initial investment. 
but you see the top of uh, perhaps so you've spotted that that's the top of an iceberg. Uh, what this means by going after the, the low hanging fruit, the high impact use cases, your whole initiative becomes a little bit like a highly leveraged loan. So you've gone to stakeholders and effectively borrowed a significant sum from their departmental budgets, right? To say, we will deliver this, we will deliver that. And you've promised that the return on that investment from those stakeholders will be you know, much greater if they have faith that you deliver and then you deliver. And there are plenty of stories about when all that doesn't go to plan and the whole thing collapses. And I'm not talking about, you know, this, I'm not going to talk about how initiatives you know, fail in the first stages today. What I want to talk about is the problem that is generated if you follow this approach of the big high value, high visibility use cases and they work, right? So it's one of those problems that we want to highlight with the economics of AI is that being successful generates follow-on problems that you need to think about early. And the problem we're trying to solve and the catastrophe we're trying to help people avoid is that an AI initiative might do really well at these initial use cases, but not actually thrive beyond that. And the reason, I said there'd be no math, but there is a graph. So the reason is, um, is this. So the costs of what it takes to build that first use case, those first use cases, and keep them running and maintained, those build up over time. And eventually, your overall producti productivity grinds to a halt. So imagine in these first 10 use cases, you attack you know, the 10 highest visibility problems that can be solved with AI in your organization. And we've got revenue is the blue line. We can call it benefit if we don't want to call it revenue in a public sector um, setting. And you can see, you know, uh, for the moment, the costs, that yellow line, are still well below the benefits, right? So profit or total benefit, net benefit to the agency, to the, to the citizens is still quite significant. Once you push into the next 20 use cases after that, you might be able to spot a little problem uh, emerging here, right? So because we're no longer into the low, lowest hanging fruit, the uh, revenue gain, right, or the benefit gain per use case is sort of tapering off and that blue line is becoming quite flat. But you can see that the costs are linear, right? So in this scenario, if costs are not brought down and controlled from the beginning, you can see what's happening to that profit line. It's heading uh, in the very much the wrong direction. So let's play this forward a little bit and say, okay, you ship 30 use cases, you know, you make 30 different stakeholders happy or one stakeholder really happy. And then you say, okay, we're doing great. We're gonna really go, go huge, go after heaps and heaps of use cases. And this is where you see this problem uh, really um, hit home. Okay, so the benefits, right? The incremental benefits per use case are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. That blue line is really flattening off. And the message here is that if you don't control those costs and make those costs also taper off along with the benefits, you're going to reach a point somewhere in your AI initiative, maybe at use case 60, but we often see it happen quite a lot earlier, that your the total costs um, of maintaining all the stuff that you've built before does not actually outweigh the incremental benefit of that next use case. Because if you think about the 60th or 70th thing you might build, it might be quite small, right? But if you're carrying the baggage of all the things that you have to maintain from before, and if you haven't found a way to drive down those costs over time, your initiative will stop. Um, and that, you know, that means, you know, you'll still be able to keep getting the, the benefit that you did uh, in the past, but you won't actually be able to go back and ask for more funding now. It'll be quite a vulnerable stage. You've burned through all the low, all the low hanging fruit. And so the way that we recommend people um, avoid this trap is to return to this iceberg and think about all of the value that um, a use case driven business case for AI is missing below the waterline, right? So if you think about the, the iceberg, the majority of the mass is below the water. It's the, the same as really true of the potential value of AI to your enterprise. So obviously to find an iceberg, you, the only thing that's visible from about, about the iceberg in the first place is those high value initial use cases that stick out of the water. 
But if we focus only on the obvious, easy and high value use cases, it's quite um, deceiving because they're not actually that common. If you're a practitioner or if you've ever tried this, you know, on that graph I just showed you, it's very optimistic to say that you would get into the that third block of use cases before you hit this problem. Really, it's going to happen after five or 10 use cases. That's what we mostly see. So when those use cases run out, your initial investors, right, who you effectively borrowed money from their budget, right, they'll be quite happy with their returns, right? You delivered to them. Everyone who invested in that first panel of the graph, the first 10 use cases, they're really happy because you delivered. And IT will also look in their program overview and they'll see these highly successful projects that started and finished and you delivered them. And they'll also think that the job is done and dusted, but what they miss, but what data practitioners know is that actually this value below the waterline depends on AI and really data and AI, data and AI capability becoming completely embedded uh, in every part of your organization and not just a special event that is funded and monitored and tracked like a, like a project. So in our view, the work of AI is actually to transform your organization. So it's not really a project like refreshing the website or opening an office or closing an office, or it's not even a project like migrating to the cloud, um, pushing the benefits of AI everywhere in your organization. It's, not, it's never actually done. But as I hinted at before, you'll be very unpopular if you now go back to these people who from their, from their point of view, you delivered some very nice use cases very successfully. And if you now go back to them and ask for additional funding to do this capability thing below the waterline, they're not gonna be, uh, they're not gonna be very happy to hear that because you were successful, you delivered to what you, what you promised. Uh, so that message won't really uh, resonate and you're unlikely to get funding to attack this value under the waterline at that stage. So if we take it back to investment terms, it's not enough to simply repay that loan, right, that you took out on the initial use cases. You need to pay back the interest and the capital and build, you know, with that money that you've borrowed from the business to deliver the initial use cases, spend some of that building something that will survive and grow beyond that initial startup period. Because if your investment case is just around the tip of the iceberg, of course, it's, it's obvious that the funding will dry up um, even if you're successful. And you know your team, right? if all that they are left to do is uh, maintain the work they already delivered, they will even go and do more interesting work uh, elsewhere. So that's the, that's, the, that's the problem as we see it. You know, a lot of attention on these big high profile use cases, you know, big value that can be delivered and people completely missing all this other value below the waterline, which becomes the, which should be the, you know, baked into the business case for your AI initiative from the beginning. So in the rest of the presentation, I'll just share you with you kind of how we articulate uh, escaping from that trap. So we'll escape the trap in, in three stages, like any complex mountain that you want to climb, it's really good to have a vision of why you want to get to the top that goes, you know, beyond its, beyond it's just there. So, you know, as I've mentioned just before, we believe that an AI initiative actually has to have the, the lofty goal of scaling up to augment and optimize processes everywhere in your organization, which means not just a single data team using AI, but lots and lots of different kinds of people using it. AI to make lots of small contributions, right, that might never have passed the business case bar initially, but together they add up. Um, and that value can be difficult to uh, articulate the same way as the initial use cases um, because it's below the waterline. So I'll give you some ways of quantifying that in a minute. Once you know why you want to get to the top, you know, you need to get started. And what we coach our customers to do here is to remove friction, right? So you can get the maximum momentum from the initial use cases. But, you know, the focus today and what I was hinting at before that people need to do is to start thinking about this middle, you know, danger period, uh, the danger zone after you've made the fast start getting up the mountain and before you're at the top. Um, basically the conditions change as you push into these um, slightly lower value, riskier and less obvious um, use cases, but you need to keep pushing further. And this uh, introduces a lot of risk, right? So compared to the use cases, 
the initial use cases where it was uh, very clear what was being invested and what the return would be. This part of your business case is about building resilience so you can overcome all the risks that emerge even if you are successful. And the way that we encourage people to do this is to think, think about how organizations manage risk um, anywhere, not just in data and, and AI, AI initiatives. And that's about building resilience, which is just the ability to bounce back and keep going when something hits you. But as I said, the, the funders of the initial use case didn't think they needed to pay for this. They paid for better recommendations on our website. They paid for better fraud detection. They didn't pay for, we need to build a long-term capability so that we're resilient and can bounce back if things change, but also push into these riskier use cases. I mean, just the amount of words I took to say it indicates that this might be, might be a little tricky. And so the same language, the same economic argument won't work um, to build this uh, business case that, that generates a sustainable AI initiative. So let's um, take a look at some of the specific things that, that you can do. Um, again, to move AI away from this special use case driven capability uh, to something that's just another capability within your enterprise. And the tagline there is that, you know, transformation, digital transformation powered by better use of data, uh, it is worth more than the sum of the use cases, right? So the use cases have a very easily quantified value, but that value below the waterline is more difficult to, to quantify. And, and I'll offer three tips on how you can try to quantify this. So the first kind of value here that you can, can, can look at of AI at scale is simply that what's the value of putting the data that people need to make decisions in front of them instead of locking it away in the silos. So as businesses, as uh, public agencies digitize further and further, right, it will become even more obvious that data from one silo is not useful by itself. And without other data, decision-making will become increasingly paralyzed. So this is a, a potential unintended consequence of digitizing processes is that silos could actually get worse and therefore decision-making, you know, increasingly paralyzed, which is not what anyone wanted out of digital transformation. So what you could do to quantify this, you could take a common sort of decision that's made across your organization today. You could do a small case study uh, on how long that takes right, for people to coordinate the decision and the data across those different silos. And then you could do an exercise where you take the same decision makers, but you first put the data in front of them from the different silos and understand what would be the difference in this ability and speed and quality of decision making if people had the data in front of them rather than locked away uh, in silos. So that's a little case study way where you can study the current way of doing things and study what a potential future would look like if data was in front of people and AI was fully democratized across your organization. Another value story you can go with, uh, particularly if you spend a lot of budget on technical resources is about um, innovation. So many pharmaceutical companies, for example, have highly specialized teams handling specific parts of their innovation funnel. And sometimes we see large organizations in government set up an innovation lab, but the problem with innovation labs, the problem with locking the innovators away from the rest of the business to protect them is that you actually reduce the diversity of perspectives you can bring to bear on the problem. And you can quantify this by you know, studying the prior innovations that happened in your agency. So all of the great ideas that changed your agency for the better in the past, where did they come from? Did they come from people locked away uh, in a lab? Or did they you know, emerge organically from people uh, who run the process knowing how to improve the process? And then a final idea is something that you, know, you as a digital or data leader will probably have to drive yourself because it's, um, this is probably the most profound point about that below the waterline value of you know, really pushing data and AI to every part of the organization. It's not just about better fraud detection or better, better individual processes. We see the ultimate goal as actually being uh, changing the way that people, people, changing the way people work towards more decentralized and autonomous working which obviously conflicts directly with how most organizations are actually set up. 
And again, tougher to quantify than uh, the increased, increased uh, click-through rate or reading time of content on your website. But, you know, another way, a way you could try to estimate this is um, look at different types of people in your business. How much time do they spend in meetings, coordinating and waiting for other people to do things? And then ask them what they would do if they had one day back per week, right? So this is something we've seen some of our customers do. Uh, by pushing some tools and some data into the hands of you know, everyday innovators, if you like, those people have managed to get back one or two days per week of, of time that they were wasting uh, doing something else. And so it's tough uh, to stand you know, at the start of your initiative and say what the future will be like, but you have to energize people with you know, a different way of working and a nice way of doing that that everyone can get behind is, or what if you had a day back a week, what would you spend that on and what would be the value of doing those things um, to the organization? And the big uh, prize, if you like, if, um, if you can get this going, is that the work that one group of people do becomes a starting point for what someone else does, but it also becomes a starting point for the, the guy with the beard in purple and then later on, some other team realizes, ah, oh, the two things that those people have done are the starting point for my thing. And that, you know, that cascade of innovation is um, scary for some people, but that's kind of how organizations are, are transformed. And if you look at digital transformation language, that's a lot of what people are trying to achieve. So if we get out of the lofty, you know, change the whole organization and how to, how to value those changes, there's a, a bunch of shorter term things that uh, our initiatives will run into. Um, halfway up the mountain, if you like. Um, and as I've been saying a few times, the, you know, it, it can be relative, it's a little bit easier to ask people, what would you do with a day back a week and, and to try and put a value on that. All of the resilience that you need to ultimately get there is, is quite difficult to, um, to, to evaluate. But again, here's three tips on how to evaluate this. This might this, these are kind of data specific, but they might work for any digital technology. So the first under the waterline value to focus on is uh, actually resilience to technology change. So anyone who's worked with digital or data for long enough knows that, you know, when you started your initiative, you were using one set of technologies. And by the time you finish your initiative in three, two to three years, some technology will have changed in the organization. And, and if you started out assuming that the technology stack would be identical uh, at the finish, it's gonna generate a lot of costly rework. And so the, there's kind of two, uh, two streams of work, uh, two streams of value you can estimate here uh, as you build a business case for, for resilience. One value stream is, you know, anyone technical has rebuilt something that they had to build. Everyone's rebuilt something in the past and that's a, that's a terrible feeling when you're a practitioner and you built something that worked in one system and then someone says, actually, now I would like you to rebuild it in this completely other technology. And so, you know, that's quite an easy cost to, um, to estimate. So for each uh, capability or use case delivered, what would it cost to build that in an alternative technology, right? And so what, your, what the investors in your business case are getting, they are avoiding paying that big one-off cost of rework by allowing you uh, a bit more slack, a bit more room in your business case initially to uh, build resilience from the beginning, right? To go a little bit slower to build things so that they are more able to be adapted. And then the other value here is that, you know, if you can achieve that resilience, it then allows the owners of those different technology components to more freely choose, right? Lots of people, uh, when they try to migrate part of their technology stack to a new technology, uh, one of the things that justifies that cost is that they're going to turn the old technology off, but that's always much more difficult um, than planned. So again, if your data and AI initiative uh, is built with this assumption that technology will change, um, that's a, that, that uh, inability to be agile and change the technology in the future is an avoided cost uh, for, for your investors and your stakeholders. Of course, it's not only technological change that you need to be prepared for in advance, it's like business and process change as well. So 
We do sometimes hear about AI initiatives. Sadly, sometimes in the public sector, these happen where the technical people go and talk to the, the business owners in some workshops. Then they go into a black box for several months to build something. And then they don't talk to the stakeholders for a while. And the problem is the longer that you stay locked away from the business and their feedback, whether it's good or bad feedback, the more the potential that you've kind of run off the road. And so that's why, you know, the value of resilience here is it's going to cost money and time. And we're going to have to work slower if we leverage diverse personas as we build any given use case, right? But the value is that they will be our headlamps, right, on the road ahead. Otherwise, all that's happening is that someone's describing a rough destination, the technical people get in the car and just start driving. And so, to quantify this value, you know, we recommend that the initial use cases that you go after not actually be purely technical in nature, but specifically uh, involve using lots of different um, personas, kinds of people. Right? So if you think about that, that will mean the use cases themselves are probably delivered a little slower, but the bet and the business case you're building is that they will be delivered in a more resilient fashion. There'll be a better uh, product in the long run, if you like. And then one thing that I'll quickly mention, we like to talk a lot about responsible AI, but the costs of getting things wrong are really high. You know, they're high enough for a private commercial organization, but a public sector organization like could do things with AI that would really destroy citizen trust in their agency or in government in, in large, at, uh, at large. And so again, building resilience so those things don't happen to your agency, that is a cost that needs to be paid up front somewhere. Um, but it's, it's a good idea to build in that way, build responsibility from the very start, right? Because you can't deliver six use cases, have one of them cause a crisis or a scandal, and then go back to the people that funded your use case and say, oh, now we need to redo them all, but we need to redo them all properly or differently now. That's not gonna be very, very popular. So again, uh, all these three kinds of value, uh, you know, they're trickier to estimate than the value of a, of a better fraud detection, um, but you know, they can help build that business case up front. Something that's really important in public sector is obviously the consistency over time. So I've talked a lot about people innovating and, and, and sharing across silos. Um, but ultimately, public sector stakeholders care about, you know, getting the same answer on, on different days. And so if you think about it, you know, there's kind of four ways we can think about um, innovation here. So imagine that we're looking for this one dark blue box in this sea of white blue bo uh, light blue boxes. It's different ways of looking about at how innovation happens. One is that, you know, uh, an executive has a vision and a dream. Another one is that a lone genius toils away and just stumbles across it. Another one could be the innovation lab that are, uh, we put you lock away people from the business to, to insulate them. And then the other model, right, that we often forget about is that actually a diverse bunch of freely collaborating stakeholders are probably going to be able to search that space and find that innovation uh, faster on average. And if you want to learn more about those ideas, you can um, look at this book by uh, Professor Scott Page. Oh, sorry, I skipped a few slides there. So to summarize, return to the iceberg and give you some take home messages. So first, I hope that you realize from all of that, that the value of a broader business case for AI is in going beyond those initial use cases. If you just stick to the use cases, you know, they're not unimportant, but they are really just there to be proof points for something bigger that you want to achieve for your organization. And those lofty goals, those bigger things you want to achieve, they can still be quantified. But I think from hopefully from the examples that I gave and, and the tips that I gave, they don't really fit within use case and project centric thinking. Right? It's, it's tough to think how you would frame and then fund a resilience use case for AI. Right? You need to get into the weeds of how your whole business works and, and find that transformative impact and attach things like resilience and the value of AI at scale um, to things that stakeholders care about. And things, those things can be risk management, risk mitigation, 
uh, and of course, uh, upskilling people for you know for the jobs of the of the rest of the century. And the third, you know, um, people building a business case for AI really need to be avoid getting shouted um, out of the room, right? For raising the risks, because if you raise the risks of what you're doing early on, so if you followed my advice and started talking about resilience against the risks of AI. You both need to be brave enough to do that, but also, you know, do it in a way that avoids you getting shouted um, out of the room, because that also might be a, uh, a very unpopular opinion. So the way to do that is to kind of reframe um, the risk mitigation as something that actually gives the people who work in your agency superpowers, right, to take risks uh, much more safely. So that's uh, that's it for today. Uh, if you're interested in kind of a more long form treatment of the ideas, there's a whole uh, paper at that address. Um, my email address is there as well, if you want to uh, get in touch with me. And so it leads me to say thank you and to uh, answer any questions, which of which there are none yet. But we have, I think, two, three minutes, Louise, to get to any questions that people might have. Yeah, we do. So now is your opportunity to send it through either on the chat or the Q&A, or even just raise your hand if you want to just um, uh, speak loud on the call here. If you're tuning into the recording later on, which I know a lot of you will be, uh, do write your question down in the comments underneath the video, and we'll be able to send that along to Sean to get back to you um, on any questions you have. But equally, uh, Sean's email's there. So uh, do, do shoot through an email um, if you think of something later on uh, and want to get in touch. Or yes, very whatever. happy to I keep know. the conversation going. Perfect. So I uh, will leave it a minute or so and see if um, anyone's got any uh, questions or do write any comments in the chat. Um, it'd be great to hear from you. I guess starting with maybe a question for myself. Um, so when in the journey should data leaders start thinking about this, this sort of topic in terms of the economics of AI, would you say, Sean? I think we are seeing more and more that people need to think about it from the beginning. And it goes back to what I said. It's, it's almost too easy to get started on the wrong path at the moment. So, you know, you, any, anyone who's like a little bit handy with, uh, you know, computers or digital technology can download some software and, and, and get started. And that's a great way to see, you know, what's possible. But... Um, and those people doing that experimentation are often not the not the leadership, right? That's the practitioners. And so we're seeing more and more, uh, particularly as organizations are now onto their second, third, fourth attempt at this. That's the other dynamic I didn't, I didn't talk about very much. Um, lots of organizations have tried and failed, failed at this several times. And, you know, perhaps one of the reasons they've failed is they haven't thought about how to build that resilience so they could actually reach uh, a sustainable initiative because if you've tried to do something expensive and challenging two or three times and failed you know maybe the way that you were starting was wrong and so we we would always say and advise customers that this needs to be part of their thinking and how they fund their initiative from day one perfect thank you so much um, no more questions that have come through um, on the live session here, but uh, Sean, on behalf of everyone that's tuned in and those tuning in later on, thank you so much for taking the time today to take us through your presentation. It's been really interesting, I think, for um, people at any stage in their kind of AI journey. So really appreciate it. And thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Uh, we'll see thanks, you everyone, for joining. Session. Thanks, Sean. Thank you.